So uh, let's move to the last talk of this session by Angeline Katina from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and she will talk about uh, the medicine of uh, Bolivia. Thank you. I am indeed <coughs> from somewhere. Uh, <laughs> currently Cleveland. <coughs> I've come all the way from Cleveland here to talk to you about South America. And that's because South America has an exceptionally rich record of Cenozoic mammal evolution. The tropics of South America are known as the Neotropics, and three orders and 28 families of mammals are endemic to this region, which is significantly more than any other biogeographic region. This diversity is due in part to and has been characterized by provinciality that developed in the early Miocene and persists today. But despite the unparalleled levels of diversity within the Neotropics, the study of South American fossil mammals has traditionally focused on faunas from high latitude extratropical localities, specifically those of Patagonian Argentina. And as a result, little is known about the paleo environments that foster the development of ancient and modern mammalian diversity within the Neotropics. <coughs> Bolivia holds great potential for improved sampling of Neotropic Cenozoic paleofaunas. Numerous fossil localities have been identified within Bolivia's sedimentary basins. Bolivia is one of the few areas with a rich fossil record of the Middle Miocene. While the mammalian faunas of these localities have been extensively uh, described, very few localities have been investigated from a paleoenvironmental standpoint. In South America, paleocells and ichnofossils have been documented at several Eocene to early Miocene Patagonian localities. And the paleopedologic and ichnologic data from these sites has proven useful for interpreting paleoclimates and paleoenvironments of these fossil mammal producing localities. This study aims to supplement the limited knowledge of neotropical paleoenvironments through the use of paleopedology and ichnology. And the early middle Miocene locality of Cerdas, Bolivia, is used as a case study to demonstrate the utility of paleopedology and ichnology for accurate paleoenvironmental interpretations of neotropical fossil localities and to facilitate investigations of mammalian provinciality within the neotropics. The Cerritos locality is composed of badlands located approximately 60 kilometers southeast of Uni, which is where the salt flats are, and it's at a modern elevation of right around 4,000 meters. Cerritos is situated on the eastern edge of the Bolivian Altiplano, which is a 200 kilometer wide east-west trending basin that's bounded by uh, the eastern and western cordilleras. Neogene sediments deposited within the Altiplano were sourced from the Cordilleras and are typically horizontally oriented and composed of fluvial lacustrine sediments, volcanics, and continental evaporites. The formation that includes the, Cerritos, or the sedimentary units of Cerritos is not formally defined, and as a result, these units are informally referred to just as the Cerritos beds. The stratigraphic section of Cerritos consists of over 250 meters of flat-lying sediments, and this study focused on the lower 50 meters, which are primarily composed of fossil-bearing fluvial custrian source sediments that have been previously interpreted as braided alluvial deposits. And the fossil fossiliferous zone of Cerritos spans between about 16 and 15 ma, but since we are looking at the lower most, most portion of these beds, we're right around that 16.3 date. At least 15 species of mammals from 11 families and 7 orders are currently represented at Cerritos, including 4 families of both Xenarthrins and Nodoungulates. And about 80% uh, of the identified specimens of Cerritos are Mesotherid Nodoungulates. The lowermost 30 meters of the Cerritos beds were studied, and paleocells were identified within the beds, and 5 sections from 4 stratigraphic intervals were chosen for detailed analysis. And these intervals are at five and nine meters. Two sections were taken <coughs> at 19 meters. They're from the same stratigraphic interval, but located 15 meters laterally from each other. And the final section was at 28 meters. Samples were collected and used for thin sections and XRF, which is bulk geochemistry. And three, pedoty three pedotypes are identified based on the pedogenic properties, the ichnofossil assemblages, and the geochemistry. Rhizoliths, or root traces, were the most common ichnofossils, and there are centimeter scale elongate gray and red rhizohalos in both the type 1 and type 2 paleocells. And gray models form during periods of reducing conditions, um, such as water saturation, while the red models form during dry or more oxidized conditions. Rhizotubules are cemented uh, cylinders that form around root molds. 
And the type 3 paleosols contain fine millimeter scale, vertically oriented, and branching calcareous rhizotubules. Vertical to horizontally oriented, non-branching, unlined, passively filled shafts are common within the paleosols. They're in all three pedotypes. And they're linear to J-shaped and circular in cross-section. And the vertical and horizontal uh, shafts or ichnofossils are assigned to uh, the ichneogenera Scolithos and Silnictus respectively. And they're interpreted as the dwelling structures of small soil arthropods. Rarer, unlined, passively filled subvertical to vertical shafts with terminal chambers are present in the type 2 and type 3 paleosols. And these are assigned to the ichnogenus Machinopsis, and these are interpreted as the reproduction structures of spiders. Lined gray complex burrow systems occur in the type 1 paleosols, and they're composed of shafts that are intersected by smaller horizontally oriented tunnels. And expanded chambers also radiate from the shafts. And these were assigned to the ichnogenus Peroinichnus and are interpreted as ants' nests. And the Ceratus paleosols commonly contain both lined and unlined amorphous red and gray models. And it's not possible to identify the potential trace makers with certainty. However, the morphology of the models uh, of the Ceratus beds indicates that they are biogenic in nature. In terms of geochemistry, six molecular weathering ratios were calculated, and three of these are hydrolysis reactions, which are just a measure of the weathering of silicate minerals. And they are base loss, leaching, and lessavage. And lessavage is just the translocation of clay. There is oxidation, which is a measure of oxidation, which is how well drained the soil was. And there's also calcification and salinization, which is a measure of the precipitation of carbonates and soluble salts. And high uh, ratios for these two are indicators of either a drier environment or a seasonal environment. Two indices are also calculated using the molecular weathering ratios. And the first is the chemical index of alteration without potassium. And it's a measuring of the weathering of feldspars and their hydration to form clay minerals. And this is given in a percent. There's also mean annual precipitation, which is given in millimeters. I'm going to go through the different pedotypes in a bit of detail. So just to reorient ourselves, the type 1 paleosols come from two sections. They're the lower two. And they occur as overlapping stacked profiles, and they're characterized by thin to poorly to moderately defined soil horizons, and are composed of red to brown sandstones and silty sandstones. Interclassed in the form of gravel-sized tufaceous, tufaceous fragments, and both laminated and non-laminated clay class are also common throughout the profiles. The ichnofossil assemblage consists of models and clumped distributions of rhizohalos, as well as scolithos, silnichnus, and the peroinichnus. And in thin section, the paleocells show weak to moderate levels of development. Skeleton grains are primarily feldspars, and some grains do have thin weathering rinds. And small iron nodules and patchy localized layers of high birefringent clay are also present in the samples. And the birefringence is caused by that lessavage or that translocation of clay. The clay grains get oriented and they uh, appear as bright streaks in thin section. The molecular weathering ratios for the type 1 paleosols show levels, values for oxidation and lessavage that are low. Base loss is the lowest at the top of the S1, S1 profile, but is otherwise moderate throughout. Leaching is moderate to high. Calcification peaks at the top of the S1, S1 profile, but is otherwise moderate throughout. And salinization is, uh, ratios are moderate to high. The chemical indexes of alteration are <coughs> low to moderate. They and um, they show decreases down section. And for the mean annual precipitation, it's also low to moderate. It ranges from about 500 to about 1,050 millimeters per year, which is about a Manchester level of precipitation. Um, if you're more familiar with American city and their rainfall, it's also about on par with a Milwaukee level of precipitation. The type 1 paleocells represent compound profiles, and I've given each paleocell a, dis a descriptive classification, as well as an interpretive classification based on the terminology used for modern soils. Due to the poorly to moderately defined soil horizons, the abundant feldspars, as well as the volcanic fragments, and the ferric nodules, the type 1 paleocells are classified as eutric ferric protosols, and they're interpreted as inceptosols, which are uh, immature incipient soils. The features of these paleocells and ichnofossils represent a shrubland community in a humid to subhumid seasonal environment. And the clump distribution of the rhizohalos is typical of a shrubland where vegetative cover and therefore root distribution is patchy. 
The seasonal variation in moisture content is indicated by both the gray and the red models, as well as the pres presence of pedogenic iron nodules, which also form during redox conditions. And there's also low oxidation and base loss in Le Sauvage, combined with high values for uh, saliniz salinization and calcification, which indicates uh, both waterlogged and drier conditions. And the type 1 paleosols likely formed on areas of uh, floodplains, within active floodplains, proximal to the braided stream channels, such as natural levees. And flooding events are indicated by those gravel-sized stephaceous lithics, as well as the uh, clay clasps. And the time of formation is estimated to be on the order of around hundreds to thousands, or tens to hundreds of years. The type 2 paleosols came from um, more of the middle of uh, the section studied. And they occur as multiple relatively thick overlapping stacked profiles and are characterized by poorly defined horizons composed of reddish brown silty sandstones and a light olive gray claystone. Interclass in the form of tefacious, gravel sized tefacious lithics um, and clay class are also <coughs> present within these profiles. And there's also a thin clay rich horizon that occurs in bro both profiles. And argilands, which are clay linings, are present in the upper portion of the S2, S1 locality. The ichnofossil assemblage of the type 2 paleosols contains, uh, consists of abundant uh, lined and unlined models and predominantly gray rhizohalos. There's also silenicness, uh, skilithos, and rare machinopsis. And in the thin section, the paleosols show moderate levels of development. The skeleton grains in the more developed, well developed areas commonly have thin weathering rinds. And small iron nodules and larger, more distinct zones of high biorefringence clay are also present in the samples. There's also a distinct horizon of angular blocky PEDs towards the top of the S2-S1 profile. And PEDs are the fundamental unit of soil, and so a horizon of PEDs is a good indicator of a paleo surface. The type 2 paleosols have values for oxidation and less lavage that are low. <coughs> Calcification <coughs> is moderate, and base loss is moderate to high in both localities. Salinization is high in both localities and increases down section and leaching is moderate to high uh, and <coughs> decreases dense section. Chemical index of alterations uh, peaks at the top of the S2-S1 profile, but is otherwise moderate throughout. And the mean annual precipitation is also moderate. It ranges from about 800 to 1,050 millimeters, which is about a penneth level of rainfall, or uh, Cleveland, if you're familiar with how rainy it can be there. <coughs> And the type 2 paleocells represent composite paleocell profiles and are cl classified as eutric argillic protocells and also interpreted as inceptosols. And the features of these paleocells and ichnofossils represent a, rush, a lush vegetative community composed of dense ground covering, covering vegetation with a high density of soil dwelling animals in a humid uh, environment with seasonally waterlogged conditions. Like the type 1 paleocells, the co occurrence of the iron nodules and both the red and gray models are good indicators of uh, seasonality, as well as the low values for less sauvage and moderate to high values of uh, calcification and salinization. And the type 2 paleosols likely formed in the distal floodplain in areas such as overbank deposits. And again, the flooding events are indicated by those uh, tefacious lithics as well as the clay clasps. And the time of formation is also interpreted to be on the order of tens to hundreds of years. And the final pedotype, the type 3 paleosols, are located from towards the top of the stratigraphic interval. And they occur as overlapping stacked profiles and are characterized by moderately well-defined horizons and are composed of brown, silty sandstones and claystones. Gravel to cobble-sized lithics are abundant in the lower portion of the profile, and clay class are common throughout the upper two-thirds of that profile. The ichnofossil assemblage consists of abundant fine rhizotubules, as well as scolithos and silenicness. In thin section, the paleocells show moderate levels of development. The skeleton grains uh, almost always have these thin weathering rinds. Small iron nodules are also present within the type 3 paleosols. There's also a single well-defined horizon of granular PEDs that's located towards the middle of the profile. The type 3 paleosols show values for oxidation and less lavage that are low and base loss that's very low. Calcification and leaching ratios are moderate to high. Salinization is high throughout. And the chemical index of alteration uh, is low, ranges from about 550 to 750 millimeters of precipitation a year, which is about a Newcastle level of rainfall or a San Francisco <laughs> level of rainfall. And these paleocells represent compound profiles. 
And do the presence of the uh, poorly to moderately developed horizons, the granular PEDs, and the abundant fine calcic rhizotubules, as well as the iron nodules. These type 3 paleosols are classified as calcic ferric protosols and are interpreted as malsols, which in the modern are typical of grassland. The B horizon exhibits a level of development that is beyond that of an inceptosol, and the abundant fine calcic root traces and the discrete zone of well-defined granular PEDs is also a good indicator of a malsol. The features of these paleosols and ichnofossils represents a uh, subhuman to semi-arid open soil ecosystem. And the type 3 paleosols likely formed on unstable landscape surfaces in a shifting fluvial environment that were subject to rapid influxes of sedimentation. So not necessarily were there grasses there, but there were small um, plants that could have occupied that space. And the time of formation for the type 3 paleosols is interpreted to range from hundreds to thousands of years. This research represents the first independent non-mammalian based paleoenvironmental paleo uh, reconstruction of Cerdis and the first detailed paleosol and ichnofossil based reconstruction in South America north of 22 degrees south latitude. The Cerdis beds contain three distinct pedotypes that represent three separate landscapes and ecosystems within a braided alluvial system. And distance from the active channel, time, and climate are the main controls on paleosol development and ichnofossil assemblages within Cerdis. The three landscape surfaces represented by the paleosols and ichnofossils are interpreted to have a general increase in aridity and are also interpreted to have varying degrees of temporal stability. And so, like the soil fauna, the mammalian fauna of Cerdis would have to be adapted to live in environments that were both seasonal and physically dynamic. The integration of data from sedimentary environments, paleosols, and uh, trace fossils re represents new and invaluable insight into neotropical paleoenvironments. Paleosol and trace fossil investigations of neotropical mammalian producing localities such as Cerdis provide robust multidisciplinary paleoenvironmental interpretations that are essential for accurate habitat based reconstructions, especially in localities where insufficient sampling may preclude body fossil based reconstructions. Investigations such as this have great utility in elucidating the causes and patterns of ancient and modern neotropical provinciality and can also be used as sample sets with which to compare to both tropical and temperate localities to thereby gain a better overall understanding of South America's rich and diverse mammalian fossil record. And with that, I'd just like to thank our field assistants and collaborators, our collaborating university. Um, Craig Grimes from Ohio University, who was very patient with me and taught me how to geochemistry as well as uh, my advisor, my master's advisor, and my co-advisor, who for some reason still put up with me. So, thank you.